welcome one and all to Haggis Hunting, where we sit down, have a chat, and do some deep dives on some deep and not so deep topics. Chance to relax and let our hair down, or at least those of us who have hair. <laughs> I am Eric. I am Rocky. And I'm Ian. The one with the hair. Our resident kilt messiah. <laughs> Fox will be scum. So, by popular demand today, we are going to do part two of our busting common myths that we have heard in our travels in the store from people online family and friends all that so as we played the game last time i'm going to i have a list here is a somewhat reduced list than uh part one so i'm gonna use a i'm gonna use a 10-sided die here uh and if i roll a zero then i'll use a four side to get you know i have 14 items is what okay. i'm saying so um any concerns or questions before we proceed I'm scared. Gentlemen, are you ready? I'm ready for this dude's mock. Okay. Now. Start your tea spilling engines. Ready? Here we go. Number eight. Hunting tartans are meant for hunting in. Hmm. Obviously. Mm. Yes, when you're chasing the wild haggises. Indeed. You must be wearing <laughs> hunting tartans. Hunting tartan. the haggis, indeed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. Um, hunting tartans were just essentially a, a way to differentiate a regular tartan or a red tartan from a different color tartan or the main clan tartan from a different, you know, color or variation of the tartan. Mm -hmm. um, similar to hunting sporins, it's, it, I think it's going too far car, calling it a marketing effort, but it's a, a name differentiator between A and B. What's it Why look? hunting and not like just Robertson alternate? Robertson alternate sounds weird. It does. It does, especially because we're so used <laughs> to like hearing. Sounds like, it sounds like an, indie, an indie band. Especially actually. since we're so used to hearing Robertson hunting, but like, why, why hunting yeah. and not something else? Um, because they're probably playing on the. If I had to guess, and again, this is not a knowledge. This is a guess. They're playing on the playing into the myth of you know, oh, you can you know, it's it's darker, so you could use it for hunting. Not that you actually did or would. Mm -hmm. um, it's just it's different from the regular clan tartan. Mm -hmm. What's the earliest evidence we have of a hunting tartan? You told me this once. I can't remember. Like no, when they first start showing up, it was like twenties, no, forties. <sighs> no, 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 no. No, we're thinking in that. That was the discussion of color palettes. So ancient versus modern mm. versus weathered. Um, okay. Hunting versus red or hunting versus regular clan tartan. That's It's been around for a while. It's just when, I don't, I'm not gonna, I don't kind of think. Like what, what would be the first clan that had two tartans? Maybe Stuart, like Royal Stuart. Well, yeah. Because sure that's an older one. A bazillion. Um, but... Yeah. And then Stuart hunting. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I don't know. Okay. Because I want to know if it's Victorian. Because my, my supposition has always been, um, and this is me being biased because I'm, you know, my, me being me, was that hunting tartans were developed because it was something that was more relaxed looking, relaxed feeling for when you went to your country place. And we're talk and, and we're mostly talking about hunting estates in the highlands, therefore the association with hunting. But it's not that you're necessarily hunting there. It's that it's the same reason why you'd wear tweeds in at your country place and you know, worsted wool suits in the city, the city being London. Um, so I was wondering if it was an outgrowth of Victorians trying to make new stuff for no good reason other than they wanted it. So it's the Victorian version of your your comfy sweatpants. Yes. Gotcha. Yes. There's a lot of there's a lot of clothing <laughs> that we think looks amazingly cool. Um, you know, we talk about the Downton Abbey thing and the Peaky Blinders thing and the you know the the Sherlock Holmes thing and all these other factors of Victorian fashion that we love. And they are essentially 19th century sweatpants. Yes, okay. it was what you wore. It was what you wore when you were relaxing <laughs> with your chosen friends on a weekend at your estate. And I was wondering if hunting tartans were an outgrowth of that culture. Whether you hunt or don't hunt on your... Correct. <laughs> now, now there is this. I mean, if you are going to go hunt, if you're going to go deer stalking, I'd rather wear something like that where if I get mud on it, it's not going to show up as much. Mm -hmm. So maybe there is some grain of truth to it just playing head devil's advocate i'm thinking time frame wise for as far as victorian like what's that 40, 1842 ish mm -hmm. was when her beginning of her reign 1901 um, to 1901 yeah the, and then edwardian is kind of kind of very similar almost the same thing yeah i'm thinking but it's you know so the the sir walter scott the sobogeski stewards that's all in that time frame and that's when the tartan craze hit 
there wasn't a ton of knowledge of tartans that existed prior to that. Mm -hmm. um, so even like the, you know, the Vestiarum Scoticum, it, you know, it had it kind of codified, you know, through through BS, but it codified a lot of the different tartans. Um, and I'm trying to think in there where they're like Stuart Hunting versus Stuart Modern or Stuart Red um, or, you know. Or Clans Originaux or any of the other yeah. books from yeah, the yeah. time. But it, Clans yeah. Originaux, I think, was 1887, I want to say. It was, it was after Scoticum. Um, so it's, I, I don't know. There may be an errant example or two pre-Victorian, but my guess would be the the majority are Victorian or, yeah, in that range, yeah. Okay. We'll want to verify that. Yeah. And we're back. So we did a, a two-second break there, looked something up on uh, our producer Adam's phone real quick. I'm um, just trying to figure out are we on track or are we completely full of BS because um, we are doing this live and not really doing a ton of research beforehand. <laughs> Uh, we were going through our mental roll decks on everything. Um, so we looked up the uh, Stuart hunting, which is the oldest hunting tartan that was in my brain that I was thinking about when we were talking about it in that segment. Um, and on the Scottish Tartan Register website, which is tartanregister.gov.uk, the Stuart hunting tartan is listed from uh, designer Wilson's Bannockburn, which is a mill uh, from, you know, yeah, you know, 1800s. Was a mill. Yep, was a mill from the 1800s. Um, the details for the tartan show details from Wilson's Bannockbird's 1819 key pattern book. This is the original correct set. Uh, the name remains a mystery. It was not considered by Wilson's to be a clan tartan. So the original. Um, uh, so we still don't know what the origin. Yeah, when did of they? When did they start calling it a hunting tartan? Or a hunting tartan was. Yeah, I. I don't know. But so this is. Stuart hunting now, but correct. When did they... It's also what it's called now, so I don't <coughs> know I mean. when it started becoming that. I wonder through... if a Stuart wore it, so people started calling it that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm speculating at best through though. wanton usage. Yes, but my my point would be that 1819 was when it was, at least that was around. So it was somewhere somewhere post 1819, pre 2023. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, 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 I still want to say that range. we're right in the basic <clears throat> assumption that it became a thing because of Victorians. And and or, but probably and the Edwardians, people who had the scratch. Yeah. People who had the money for more than one kilt in the first place. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or the mills who were just wanting to give options to their customers. They're like, mm -hmm. I don't want the bright red Stuart Tartan. Oh, well, here's another one. It's mm -hmm. green. Oh, OK, well, I'll wear that one. And you know, I'm a steward as well. So we'll call this one Stuart something else. Hmm, what comes to mind? Oh, it looks like it could go well for hunting. I'll call it Stuart hunting. I don't it's want to look like I'm starting a punk band. What, what's the tartan for me? <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other Stuart discussion right there. <laughs> well, here's 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 where it comes into play with with uh, with people now is that we've occasionally gotten concern from customers. Oh, I'm going to an official clan gathering, mm. or I'm going to a wedding, or I'm getting married in a wedding. Um, I don't want the hunting tartan. I need the official clan tartan. I so I can't get the hunting tartan even though I like it better. So you could also lump I want the in formal tartan. Yes, right. And you can also lump in um, color palettes with that as well. Well, I shouldn't wear the weathered because I'm getting married in it. Mm -hmm. So the weathered isn't formal enough. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's BS. As that's well. all BS. Yep. Yep. It is all in how you accessorize and how you dress it up or dress it down yeah. that matters for what the tartan is as far as formal or informal, mm -hmm. whether it's weathered or modern, whether it's the Stuart dress, whether it's Stuart red royal, or whether it's Stuart hunting, mm -hmm. doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you have a favorite hunting tartan, either of you? I mean, obviously, kilts and culture. <laughs> That's more weathered. I'm thinking weathered more so than hunting. <laughs> um, it's also not a variant on anything yeah. else. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the only one that I own is the Robertson hunting weathered. So I'll go with mm -hmm. that one. Hmm. You? Um, I don't really have a clan tartan, and do, so I'd be going more by strict design because I'm not really Scottish. Um, I Ooh. have. I know. I know. Well, it's not a secret. Um, the stop the, recording. Stop recording. <laughs> um, Shut it all down. <laughs> Stewart of Appen hunting. Mm -hmm, I do mm -hmm. like a lot. Actually, um, I would agree. One. That yes. is a good one. And the, the Stuart Old Tartan, my wife's a Stuart, so right. the uh, Stuart Old Tartan is another one that kind of has the same vibe that I really dig on. Cool. How about yourself, Eric? I like uh, Amblungus hunting. 
Mm. And Blungus. And Blungus. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a very small clan. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Small indeed. Um, apostrophe Blungus. Yeah. I'm not really into <laughs> the traditional spelling. Of yes, course. exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, it has to be the original Gallic um, from the original Dwarvish. Uh, no, it's uh, because all dwarves are Scottish. Now, the, um, I don't, there's not a lot of hunting tarns I really groove on. I, I agree. Sir of Appen is beautiful. Um, but I tend to more like the old color stuff, more jewel tones. So, yeah. But Stuart hunting, I would wear because I do have Stuart blood. So, and I'd rather wear that than the regular Stuart because it's fun that it's a little asymmetrical too. Yeah, and, and, and fun. regular Stuart, <laughs> like your Italian spit blood. Excuse me, <clears throat> I was saying, um, Royal Stuart is just—it's too ubiquitous. Like your joke yeah. a minute ago about you know I don't want to look like I'm starting a punk band. You know, or like I'm wearing the liner of a jacket that I got at L. Beans. You know, it's it's, it's that's a pro I think that's a problem with it. I think bigger clans are more likely to have variant tartans because people don't want to wear the standard one. Mm -hmm. So and, but I fall into that camp. Yeah, definitely. Hundred percent. The uh, the thing that I like about um, I have I do have a Royal Stewart tartan, but it is Royal Stewart weathered. So it's mm -hmm. or my wife has the Stewart of Appen Stewart of Appen eighteen nineteen variant, um, which essentially looks like Royal Stewart, but there's like a there's three green lines at the at the pivot in the red, so it looks a little different. It's like it, you, you look at it, it you're a like mistake. it look no I don't think so because um, it's a Stewart of Appen tartan, but it, it's it's one of those where you look at it, it. I like tartans where you look at it and you're like I recognize it, but there's something a little different. Why? Mm. And it makes you kind of it breaks people's brains. I like I like hurting people's so brains. It's kind of like the subtle difference between is it McLean of Duart and the um, tilted kilt tartan? No, it's or was Royal it, Stewart. Was it, was it Royal Stewart? I wasn't sure. Yeah. They just like flip the yellows and the whites, yeah, yeah, <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that still shouldn't have been registered. That's BS. <laughs> okay, ready for another one? Sure. Yeah. Right, Speaking of uh, of um, you know myths, <laughs> mm -hmm. that's a real tart. <laughs> no, it's not. Not my book. Number three, you must be regimental under the kilt or you are not a true Scotsman. Yeah, Ian. Or if you wear anything underneath, then it's a skirt. Mm -hmm. We'll add to mm -hmm. this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's completely true. Moving of on. Course. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You must chafe your man bits at mm -hmm. all times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Down in the store, I do get a lot of questions on, uh, on what to do down there. And what I always tell people reliably is that what you call your crotch the store <laughs> down in my store. <laughs> phrasing, Ian. Are the we not doing phrasing anymore? <laughs> For the record, people, the, the studio which we are in is upstairs, and the store is downstairs. Oh no, I meant I meant down there. No, I know. That's not right. <laughs> I just wondering who's asking you what to do down there, well, and when, and first, are they on their time, knees, or when first, they ask you this? Or? First time kilt wearers are often very concerned about it. <laughs> If, if they are, in fact, a first-time kilt wearer. Oh, I'm too and broken to go on. What I always tell people is do what do what makes you comfortable. And, and don't listen to any of that. Unlike this conversation, do what makes you comfortable. Does he have a face that looks like it just screams? Please, ask me about underwear. So you're there, it's just like, you know, while you're down there, just do whatever's comfortable. <laughs> Glad you guys are having such a good time. <laughs> This is a very serious question that a lot of people have. Okay, let me reset. Let me reset. <laughs> no, like a lot of folks do do it the regimental the regimental way, of course. Yeah. Um, but I always tell people there's all kinds of reasons why you might choose to do it differently and there's no rules. Um, the idea that a specific time period that you are romanticizing in the past, they all did it one way is very unlikely for one. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's plenty of good reasons too. Uh, in, in fact, I started wearing something underneath the kilt a long time ago, particularly when I had a three-year-old who you know, I was dropping her off at daycare. Last thing I needed was right. <laughs> yep. the right. police being called because some something untoward happened, especially when you know right. little kids will walk up and just put their arm up your leg. Mm. <laughs> They're not yeah. even paying attention mm -hmm. and they don't care. Yep. Yep. Daddy, yep. daddy. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, sure. So, and I find that it helps quite a bit with chafing as a, as a little bit of a larger gentleman. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, maintains modesty. If you're sitting yeah. down and you know, and you're, Sporn has fallen between your legs and your mm -hmm. you know knees are apart as men want to do then mm -hmm. it, you know it helps with that a little bit you're okay but you you're still you have to make sure everything yeah. is precisely arranged consider your context so that, and how likely yeah. you are to be super aware of 
how you're setting. Now, now here's, I don't have any hard data on this. I am not going to start an internet poll, so please do not ask us. Um, I am very curious uh, for the two of you. What do you think? Now, taking all of the the male bravado, oh, I don't wear any underwear, it's not a skirt, it's a kilt, ha ha, out of it. Um, what do you think the percentage of people, of men, that wear kilts do not wear underwear? Do it's not. Tough to say. I would say it's higher than it is for pants because of the thing you told us to take out of the equation. Um, and the people who don't wear underwear are louder about it. I, I don't have, do you have a number? I don't have a number. I don't, I, I can't <laughs> yeah. remember. What's your, what's your gut? Either of you. 50, 50, maybe, but anywhere from 25, 75 in either direction to 50, 50 wouldn't surprise me. Okay. I don't have to guess because um, it, the data is old now, but there were a few years ago, there was a article done in Scotland by like the Scottish Times where they, they asked, they did a poll, how many men who are wearing the kilt wear under, underwear or what do they wear? Did they filter for people who actually they, wear? Now hold, don't tell me because I want to guess first before you give us the official answer if there was a thing. Okay. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to butt in. Um, my guess was 35% do not. And sixty five percent do. You're not, you're not too far off. I mean, again, I, it's been a while since I looked at, but essentially okay. they divide it into thirds. It was it was either boxers, or close fitting underwear, like bike shorts or you know briefs Brief. of some kind or regimental, and it was kind of a three way split. Okay. Although regimental was actually a little lower than the other two. Hmm. So yeah, it was about, so, about a third or a little under a third, actually. I'd be okay. curious for, how for, much this varies from occasional kilt wearers, like Scott's often are, you know, weddings right. and funerals, right. uh, versus uh, everyday kilt wearers, especially here in the US. I, I'd be kind of curious to see how that varies across different I, I would, types I would, of kilt I think wearers. it's probably more like a 50-50 thing in the States Yeah, because of how passionate we get about this stuff in the diaspora mm -hmm. than With people the back then do. Yeah. yeah. Even yeah, then, because, I wonder about the difference between a guy who wears it three times a year on St. Patrick's Day at his local festival, and then and then maybe again on you know St. Andrew's Day or or something like that, versus somebody wears it every day and are mm -hmm. you know, incorporating it into their everyday life. Mm -hmm. But I, even that, as that was as, the difference for me. Yeah, and 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 for me too, because for for a long time, for me it was just seasonal. Yeah, you know, in in the warmer weather, the ventilation is nice, so it would mm -hmm. go regimental. In the cooler weather, we wear underwear. You know, if it was a company function, wear underwear. If I'm on a hiking trail, who cares? But you, as you and I have talked about, yeah. you don't always want to do that because getting chiggers or yeah, ticks or whatever up yeah. there kind of sucks. <laughs> See, I'm kind of upset on the Literally. hot days. I almost need need it more for the the chafing concern. <laughs> if you're an emotional, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like that's I'd often wear it to Celtic Classic or Celtic Fling mm -hmm. before I was an everyday kilt wear, and I'm walking all day. I'm sweating and. I'd have problems. <laughs> so it's activity related <laughs> yeah. for you. Yeah. I get that too. I mean, there would be days like when I was working down in the warehouse and we're just, you know, or, you know, going back and forth from the, the, the store to the warehouse all day in August. And it's like, yeah, okay. I'd rather have the ventilation. Now. Yeah, I agree. Chafing and stuff. If you're out, you know, really working up a sweat, then yeah, more appealing. But of yeah. course that is why they have anti-chafe. Yeah. But, but the point, I think the, the, the point that we need to underline here is, you do not have to no, wear no. nothing underneath the kilt. You do not have to wear underwear. Mm -hmm. It's personal preference. You do what you want to do, whatever you're comfortable with or not comfortable with. Mm -hmm. That is how you should be guided in this decision as well as every decision in right. life. Yeah. The term uh, regimental is, is legit. It was actually a tradition in the Scottish regiments around the turn of the century. Um, earlier than that, probably a bit also, but there is also plenty of record of guys uh, wearing underwear in the trenches in World War I. Uh, and there is plenty of record of officers wearing like silk boxers hmm. and such, even though it was, like it, was, a it, was a, it was uh, required for the enlisted men, officers didn't necessarily have to follow the rule. Hmm. So the whole bit about having the, the, the shoe mirror thing, the, 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 the sergeant doing, you know, or, or sergeant major or whatever doing the inspections <laughs> would actually have, a, he would actually have a swagger stick with a mirror on the bomb and they would inspect like that. Hmm. So that part is legit or was for a number of years. And it's still, it, it's, but it's been a joke since the beginning. Like, like you, you see, you see like the French, the, the, the French lithograph from the Napoleonic era of the French women looking, looking under 
the the Scots kilt as he bends over, you know. And then in the '60s or whatever, they had the movie Up the Kyber. You ever seen mm -hmm. it? No. It's it's a it's a British comedy, and it's about a fictional regiment in northern India during the Raj, and they wind up scaring off the bad guys by all lifting their kilts at one mm. point. You know, they, they, the, the entire the, the regiment just goes ah, lifts their kilts, and all the bad guys are like ah, and they run away. So. Yeah, talk about a job in the military I would not want is the guy who has to walk around with, with the, the mirror, mirror to look under each See, that's funny, You've been suggesting that as a policy here for a while, and we keep talking you out of it. Yeah. <laughs> the mirror I didn't mind. It was the camera I was really yeah. concerned about. <laughs> yeah. I didn't mind the people. It's, it's fine. So while I don't try to, would never try to convince somebody that they should or that they shouldn't wear underwear, I do have very strong opinions about type. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah, I feel pretty strongly you don't want anything too bold. You don't want, you know, like crazy mm, okay. graffiti I, I patterns and things like that. You know, black for me, generally speaking, or solid color at least. And I want like a something that hugs the leg. You don't want a loose boxer, like some kind of athletic material, like a spandex, mm -hmm. you know, kind of a thing. Do you That's get people? Do you get people in the store asking you for recommendations on a type of underwear? If they say they're going to wear underwear. Um. No, but sometimes I'll preemptively be like, give, <laughs> give some bad idea, bad examples of what not to wear, okay. you know? <laughs> I'll stop people on the street. Excuse me. Yes, <laughs> Let me tell you what kind of underwear you need to wear today. So before they, you know, as soon as they come in the door, it's like, before you start shopping, I, I have say, to tell you. Let me tell you about underwear. You should you should think about it a little bit if you're going to wear underwear, though, I, you know? Plan ahead. I totally agree. Yeah. But I, I've always done black. Yeah. You know, like, like briefs or, or, I, or bike shorts or something, because, yeah, you don't want the boxers with the lipstick. Yeah. Unless you're a total <laughs> douche like that. You know, it's like, oh, aren't I clever? <laughs> you know, I was wearing more of a loose boxer when I first started being an everyday kilt worker. I had to rethink my whole underwear situation when I started mm -hmm. wearing it with kilts. <laughs> <laughs> my underwear situation. Yeah, I'll, I'll remember the day yeah. I had to gotta totally rethink, rethink my entire underwear situation. Phrases you never think you would hear. The it's underwear like situation is my new band. <laughs> there you go. That, no, I, I, I'm sorry. I still have the ultimate punk band name. What's that? Unsightly hair. Hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that that, that more was my a thrash metal band. But that was my friend Bill's. <laughs> that was my friend Bill's band back okay. in the day, and I will never forget that. Mine. So, Mine will always be mildly irate. Mildly if irate. I, if yeah. I start a band, it's going to be called I'm mildly irate. the title irate. of your autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's actually pretty fair. In high school, I was briefly in a band called Misnomer. I liked that as a that's name. That's cute. It's fun. That's cute. That sounds like an indie. <laughs> yeah, fan. yeah. I like that. Uh, it, it, it defied uh, easy. Right. Description, of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little jazzy, a little funky, a little ska-like. Uh, you know. I had no idea you were in a band. <laughs> briefly. Briefly. What did were so you they kick singer you out. or what saxophone? Did you, saxophone. Yeah. Okay. You play the saxophone. I did. I haven't played it many years. <laughs> he can make it squeak now. <laughs> it's about like me and the Tim Whistle. <laughs> I have a saxophone at home. Don't don't. Mm. don't, don't it it. Bring Is it, it a baritone? I'm a baritone saxophone. Uh, I don't know. You you would know if you had a baritone. It's not mine. It's my kids. Insanely freaking expensive. Okay, then it's not a baritone. <laughs> I've looked into it's getting back into it. They're like even like broken, hardly able to be played ones are like five thousand dollars. <laughs> Zoinks. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's get back to the myths. Okay. No, we already did number three, and we still did number three. The dice are broken. The dice are weighted. Loaded. Yeah. Number nine. Number nine. You Number nine. Wavy. Paul is dead. Ancient colored tartans are older than other tartans. Hmm. Yes. Asterisk. Eh. Ish. <laughs> Asterisk. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, fight. 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 Yeah. <laughs> you coming at me, bro? Um, the uh, when I talked to uh, Dr. Wayne uh, from the National Museum of Scotland a couple about a month and a half ago, um, it I never thought about that and i don't know why it never came up as a thing that i was like interested to know when the origins of you know ancient versus modern versus weathered were um because you, you never think of it um but the uh wilson's bannockburn colors are different a little more jewel tony where mm -hmm. it's navy for blue scarlet red for red the green is more of an olive kind of green um and those were just wilson's bannockburn was the biggest mill um you know, back in the day, back in the 1800s or late 1700s, all the way through the beginning of the, the 20th century. Mm -hmm. um, and their standard color palette 
was, you know, this is the color that they used for red for the most part. I'm speaking broadly, of course. This is the color that they use for red. This is the color that they use for green, et cetera. Um, and the, the color palettes that we know today of modern versus ancient didn't actually come into being until, uh, according to Rosie, until the uh, like early, early to mid 20th century. So around like the 1920s, mm-hmm. There was, uh, she knew of an example of a gent that was playing around with um, chemical dyes and kind of like trying to recreate older looking tartans. Um, So that kind of became a thing and that's what led to it. We don't know exactly like here's the date where they started modern, here's the date where they started ancient. Um, But we do know that in the 1950s, DC Dog Leash um, played around with reproduction, aka weathered colors. So mm-hmm. somewhere between, let's say, late 19 teens and 1950 is when the uh, the ancient and modern tartan color palettes kind of became codified. Mm-hmm. So that's the the time range. My understanding, and correct me if I'm mistaken, because this is definitely like I loosely remember reading about this several years ago, is that the ancient color palettes came about as an attempt to imagine what tartans must have looked like given the dyes that were readily available at the time people were romanticizing. Yeah, right. plant dyes. So, yeah. yeah. yeah, That's the marketing spin. And they may waste. or may not have nailed it. I think a lot of time they didn't. I think yeah. the, the, the problem you have is that um, uh, you could get very, very vibrant colors out of natural dyes. This is, this is just a fact. But um, they're not necessarily, they're not color as color, ranges. well, they're not as color fast. They will fade more quickly mm. over and time, at, and at different rates potentially and at different as rates. well. So, so a lot of time, if you're looking at an older specimen, uh, you know, a historic example, then it might look washed out, or it might look faded, or the, the the colors have changed a bit. And then people look at that and don't take into account the fact that the color has has changed. faded, and they think, oh well, this must be how everyone dressed back then, and they did it so they could hide in the heather from their enemies, and it was. You know, it was camouflage. It was all old and drab and dark. Yes, yes. yes. And they didn't have light except for torches. There was no color. Frankly, I'm impressed they had color back then over in the UK because we were still in black and white over here. I know. All the the films are black and white, even (laughs) photographs from back then. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe sepia toned at best. And they all talked with a funny accent, too. (laughs) Um, But but you see what I mean? It's like Mm -hmm. um, they they so, so the idea of the marketing spin and I, I I knew that was why people did it. I didn't know for sure what the time period of when they did it was. I had, I had kind of assumed it was sometime around the turn of the century. So I guess I'm not surprised to hear that. That, but again, it goes it goes into the whole. I want something different. Mm-hmm. This I, is too bright. I want for me. options. I want options. Yeah. yeah. I again, you know, I go back to the you know taking something from back then and kind of putting it in today's terms or in today's like mindset of, you know, people back then didn't just want one thing. They may not like their clan tartan if there's only one and they may have wanted options too in the same way that we want options today. Um, Their society wasn't nearly as consumeristic as it is right now, but Mm -hmm. doesn't mean they didn't want options. Didn't want, didn't mean they didn't want choices. Mm -hmm. And Mills would have wanted to have distinguished themselves if they could, like you said, with Daglish in the 50s, creating these reproduction tartans. They wanted a yep. way to distinguish from themselves from the other mills. And have, have a second bite at the apple, hopefully. Yeah. Like, oh, well, you already have this tartan, but do you know you could do this one too? Yep. Yeah. Or if somebody comes in and says, well, I like I like that tartan, but it's a little dark. Can you make something a little bit lighter and I'll mm-hmm. buy you know a bolt of it? Then... Sure, if you got the money, we'll play with it. Sure, we'll right. have lighter green and lighter blue and that kind of thing. Or I don't want to dress like my pa. Yeah, there, there's all kinds of yeah. you know, psychology and mental things that go into it that we don't necessarily ascribe to it, but they were people in the same way that we are people with the same wants and desires and all mm-hmm. that. Now, this is painting with a really broad brush then, and I know that historians we know would dispute this right off the bat, but just as a rule of thumb, would you say then, based on your talk with... Dr. Wayne, that if you wanted an impression just vaguely across the boards of how a lot of tartans looked um, pre 20th century, that you really should be looking at the Wilsons of Bannock Burn palette, Color palette only. So the more jewel tone kind of vibe, um, like you said. 1800s, sure. Yeah. 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 But if you're trying to go older than that, it's tough. Well, then you get into 
yeah, you then get into historical samples and archaeology. And I know that like Peter McDonald did a whole thing on a uh, a tartan from Culloden. There's the, the, the Glen Affric, Glen Affric, uh, Affric, yeah, the new okay. one that just came out. No, I was thinking about the well, old one, the original, the 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 coat. Yes, 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 yes. With the with the that was the I guess the source for the 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 Culloden tartan or something like that. Right. Um, and people have been misinterpreting what it probably actually looked like back in the day for ages now. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. And, you know, the same thing, even the even the reproduction tartans, um, you know, where the the story surrounding the reproduction tartans was dog leash. Uh, I don't know which dog leash it was, you know, the, the grandfather, whoever it was, uh, at, you know, whoever was alive in the 50s running the mill. <laughs> um, Joe basically said, yes, we were we were given a, a piece of cloth from a client that they that they found it in a bog and we kept it in a safe and we you know faithfully reproduced the colors of x y and z and this is the the exact thing and then there was a and they came out with the reproduction colors um to where you know a browns and grays and kind of a drab kind of look to it um and it really was just marketing because there were several people that went to them and said hey you know we we'd love to see the sample that you have we would love to see it. Let, let's show it let's bring it out like show us what you have oh no 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 we we, we can't bring it out and then, <laughs> then i gave it back to the person so it was it was bs marketing but it was good bs marketing that stuck um so the marketing was BS, at least it was but, good but, BS but the product marketing. was good correct it was it was worth now yeah did they purport that that is what the sample came to them looking like or yes. is it what they presumed it to have looked like before it went into the bog Exactly. I, for, I forget the, I, I remember reading a couple articles on it from the, the old uh, Scottish Tartans Authority website, which is now like no longer an active, like they're playing with the website and changing it up. So I can't find the article right now. But the, uh, uh, yeah, it was, you know, they have reproduced the colors of how I believe how it came out of the bog right. was what I believed it to be. Um, and it was just, you know, they took all the clan tartans then and came up with their reproduction range mm -hmm. um, to make them look like they were, you know, old in and weathered and laid out in the sun and <laughs> they, in a they bog took a and color whatever. palette from this supposed specimen of Correct. Yeah. Okay. Reality, they just sat around to go, hey, we want to create a new color palette to be able to differentiate ourselves from mm -hmm. the other mills, which is fine. It's mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. the it's the the lying that gets me for those kind of things. It's the stretching the of truth. Sobietskis, it's the whatever. Sobietskis, though. It's like I know. part of the tradition, man. Yeah. <laughs> You're saying lying is a Scottish tradition? <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying in the weaving industry it is, at if least. The fits. <laughs> <laughs> mm. yeah. If the buckle robes fit. Oh. Don't wear them either. Um, no, but it's, 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 mar it's, it's, it's my desire as a honest broker marketer to spin a story but have it be a real story with real meaning not just make something up out of thin yeah. air um that's what bothers me about it i agree i mean we we kind of have a luxury of living when we do now that there's actually more history of the art form commercially than there was back then yes we can talk about the evolution of this and the evolution of that because they created greater variety for us to talk about you know fair but and and that was prior to the idea of making a symbolic tartan which is something you can do now yes you know you can actually make a tartan and say i don't care what these colors are i've got fluorescent chartreuse and navy blue and this tartan represents the dream i had last night you know and so you're not limited like you were like oh, we gotta make a new stewart tartan how are we gonna make this look any better how are we gonna convince people to buy this it's like you know we, we have more liberty now yeah with the art form agreed so okay cool all right Ready? Next. Yep. Okay, next. Number six. Ba, ba, ba. Inside, do you that's get the, that? That's the checking off music, and I don't. Should I? Number six, The Prisoner. It was a cult show back in the 60s. Mm. Come on, all you old nerds back me I up. was born. Yeah. <laughs> it's a cult classic. <laughs> I watched it in college. What are you talking about? Number six. Uh, the Great Kilt is actually the only real kilt. <sighs> yeah, that just, that, it, it feels wrong even <laughs> just saying it. It's, it's not even a kilt I, yet. <laughs> it's yeah. not even, yeah, it's not, it's, it's yeah. a blanket. It's a big, long piece of cloth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the only, it's the only true blanket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, no, great kilt is just a big, long stretch of cloth. So 
and that you hand pleat on the floor, roll yourself up to, and that would be the original kilt. I would go so far as to say it's the original. But it's I the wouldn't. Only. I wouldn't say the only. It's the only. It's the only real kilt, Rocky. I mean, well, only on. only true Scotsmen don't wear underwear, Eric. Right. Know, it's, right. It falls in the same line. Yep. It's the. I'm. I want to be in the circle and exclude everyone else from the circle type of mentality. I want to feel special. Yes. I think that's where I think that's where it comes from. It's basically, you know, uh, it, it, I don't know how this one started. I've only heard it a couple of times, but it's definitely out there, but, but yeah, heard reenactors. Heard well, kind of, I mean, it's gotta be somebody, well, somebody who was trying to be a reenactor and then got kicked out of his unit <laughs> for being obnoxious. But I was like, oh, well, it takes skill and, and dedication yes. to actually yes. wrap a Philomore, therefore, you know, that makes it the true kilt because there's a way to it as opposed to just strapping something on your body like a woman's it's skirt. Do you think it's that that? Is it like, is yeah. it? Is it's a, it's the is machismo. I'm, no, no, I, I'm right. You're wrong. It's it's just, it's someone who wants to be, you know, argumentative. Gatekeepy. Yeah, mm -hmm. gatekeepy and argumentative. Yeah. It's a weird place to gatekeep though because great kilt wears, although it's gotten a lot popular, they're still the minority. Oh, agreed. A vast yeah. minority. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's- I, It's it, growing dramatically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? I think there's more people interested in historical clothing more so than ever before. Fair, fair. And yeah. we always talk about how fashion is cyclical. Yeah. Um, like, you know, people wanting, you know, tweed becoming back in fashion mm -hmm. due to like Downton Abbey and, you know, the Peaky Blinders thing. And I think it's it a lot more socially cool. acceptable to do, whether it's reenacting or just some kind of like murder mystery party where everybody dresses up or, you know, any kind of, you know, Ren Fair. People wear them a lot to the Ren Fair, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I have a, I have a, a hot take on that. I think people spend so much money on like Ren Faire costumes or, or, or Comic-Con costumes or things like that. Anything like that, like that where it's a, a passion of yours and you don't feel like you're getting your money's worth out of it because I'm, I only wear it for, you know, two weekends a year, three weekends a year. And you feel like you have to wear it to more things. So there's a desire to kind of incorporate it into other parts of your outfit or other daily wear type thing to feel like, okay, now I'm getting money's worth out of it. Or I have fun wearing it here and people seem to be making good comments about it. Eh, I want to play with it and wear it over here as well or wear it to the store or wear it to, you know, a concert or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I That's true of kilts broadly too. Yes. I would say. Yeah, I think it's 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 you could call it like a bleed over effect. Yeah. It's like, yeah, this is fun. I, I have fun when I'm wearing it. Well, I'm not just gonna leave it in the closet. Yeah. And we used to I mean you used to do that intentionally in the SCA and other reenactment groups, you just you call it freaking the mundane, and you'd like go out in full medieval kit to McDonald's just to just to have people gawk at you. You know, it was fun. Nowadays you wouldn't get the same reaction that you did back <laughs> 20 years ago why else would you bother to go to zen kai khan and then travel around the town the rest of the day yeah yeah <laughs> um but nowadays it's, yeah, it's, i think there's so much more alt fashion these days um and and again a, a bleed over effect of people wanting to play with the fun stuff and i think i i i think that it's i get into one of my philosophical saws with this where it's basically i think there's a uh for some people there is a desire a much stronger desire now for something naturalistic Mm. For some guys, it is feeling like you have a more legit connection to an ancient culture, especially yeah. an ancient warrior culture, you know, and, and so they're they're trying to it's it's for some people, these fashions to start doing the this. He's uh, he, he'll hit his microphone. He's not allowed to. <laughs> um, but there, there's um, there's an old Maori expression that, you know, a man with that without tattoos is invisible to the gods. Hmm. And I know people who talk about their tattoos as being psychic armor. You know, it just makes them feel more confident. It makes them feel, you know, spiritually connected, maybe, or it makes them feel more, you know, um, empowered, for lack it's, of a better word. You can see why you'd connect that to wearing a kilt. Exactly. I think I think these a lot of alt fashions, it's the same thing. So kilts are definitely that. And then once regular kilts start getting popular, well, how am I going to do something that feels special now? Everybody else is wearing a regular kilt. Even specialer. Or, a, you know, a utility kilt. Yeah. Yeah. But there's also, but the simplicity of it is also appealing. Mm -hmm. You know, but I mean, I picked up on this vibe a long time ago. There was a, um, I can't for the life of me remember his name, but there was this dude who's a, he was a, a black freelance writer, wrote for a couple of magazines and he was on NPR for a while and stuff. But he, um, 
He was out in, uh, was out in Ohio. And he wrote a, an article that I read many years ago called Sarong Song. Because he, he had taken up the idea of wearing a sarong um, as daily wear. And this was like really out there for the time. Because this was like, you know, early 2000s. Um, and Ohio. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, so he was in, he was in Cleveland, so, so it's not oh. Cleveland's kind of special. But, oh. um, but you know, he he talked about the reactions he got to it and and his motivations. And it was basically about feeling empowered and 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 kind of you know flipping off the macro culture, and, and also that. and also having a connection to his ancestors and and to you know a sense of ancientness, a sense of timelessness. And so he he and he he rocked it. And I was like, that was one of the first people I read about who's other than kilts. Who was doing a non bifurcated gar garment, not government, non bifurcated government? <laughs> like the that, bifurcated that is the problem with our government. government these days. They're way too bifurcated. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you take my point. The point is, I, I think that vibe has gotten a lot stronger in the past few mm -hmm. years because it's more acceptable. People have more of a give a damn attitude about fashion in general. Yeah. Yeah, you know, for better or for worse. So, new, new t shirt idea. A Scotsman without his kilt will not be seen by the gods. <laughs> Eric Munson. I dig it. I dig it. <laughs> I'm not sure everybody would dig that. But, but yeah, I, but but to say it's the the only real kilt is just it's ego boosting. Yeah, you're just trying to you're just trying to boost yourself yeah. and, get, and gatekeep. Yeah, I, more I think more gatekeeping. I don't know about ego boosting, but it's the it's the gatekeeping. Gatekeeping thing. is always ego yeah. boosting, in my opinion. Eh, okay, fair, fair. I'm doing this right. You're doing it wrong. That's totally an ego thing. Yeah, I don't tend yep. to listen to people like that, no matter what the topic is. Right. <laughs> yep. Yep. Fair as well. Yeah. Oh, wait, that's so special. <laughs> you go have fun now, little boy. <laughs> Ready? Indeed. Okay. Nope. Already did that. Likely story. Number five, William Wallace wore a kilt. <laughs> yeah. And we can, we can address Hollywood in general <laughs> and the misperceptions people get from Hollywood. Sure. We get orders for William Wallace. That's I get true. work here yeah. now, Mo. <clears throat> yeah. The, I would say you never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Mm. Um, the Hollywood's uh, reasons for making a movie are different than your potential reasons for wanting to consume a movie. Um, they are trying to, you know, placate the masses, i.e., you know, lowest common denominator, have something that as many people will want to watch as possible. Therefore, it has to be a good story. It has to have good, you know, bones to it. And if the truth does not speak to that, does not go to that mean, that end, um, then they're just going to take liberties and that's going to be what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Um, so no, William Wallace did not wear a kilt. Mel, he was mm, not from nope. Australia. Did not look like Mel Gibson. Um, did not sleep with the princess. Exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, didn't sleep with the princess because she would have been like three at the time or something, something. like that. Yeah. 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 There's a whole lot of weirdness in that. Well, there's a lot of time compression in the movie. Yes. Yeah. 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 He just nodding. He's like, <laughs> "Yep." I'm just I'm just stunned to hear he's an Australian. I thought he came over. <laughs> Just to fight the British. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I figured he was Aborigines, so, like, you know, they miscast uh -oh. him a little bit, but, like, come on now. <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> I think we broke Eric. William Wallace, who introduced the didgeridoo <laughs> to the Highlands. <laughs> the the only true accompaniment to the bagpipes. Indeed. As an ultra scoutsman, though. As, as Albanach knows. As well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Didgeridoos are awesome, but they're not very Scottish. No, not at all. Just like great kilter, not very, you know, fourteenth, thirteenth century. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. Now that said, we have acknowledged that that film helped propel our industry. Yes. Oh yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you know, not it's just Scottish stuff in general. Yes, and not just us acknowledging, as well as the mills, as well as other kilt makers, as mm -hmm. well as the tourist mm -hmm. industry, mm -hmm. as well as, you know, a hundred other things have all acknowledged and said, yes, that the net effect was positive. And speaking to, you know, Scottish friends of mine, um, I think the, the quote was, you know, we all publicly hate Braveheart, but we've all seen it and love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, let's not forget that there was that unofficial William Wallace 
statue, using the term loosely, that <laughs> sculpture uh, based on Mel Gibson from the movie of William Wallace. It was actually on display, um, I think, at the base of the Wallace Monument for a while. And it was this horrible, <laughs> horrible piece of art that somebody made of the Mel Gibson style William Wallace doing this, the freedom scream. And it didn't look like him that much. Oh, it was, yeah. it was god awful. It. But it was a, it was donated by somebody, and they just they kept it there <laughs> for years, for years. And so, and finally, someone was like, "Can you believe this shite?" You know, it's just like, "Can we please take it down now?" <laughs> has I, it been enough time? Has has, has Mel Gibson left the country? Yeah. Now we can remove it. Oh my gosh, I think um, going back to the motives of the movie studios, you also have to factor in a certain amount of you have to show people what they're expecting. If you show a historical Scottish film, and most people aren't that well read on Scottish history, believe it or not, especially in America, you know, why aren't they in kilts? This is Scotland. They've been wearing them for centuries or, you know, millennia, right? Mm. <laughs> this is their thing. This is what they're famous for. Yeah. Yep. If you, so, don't, if you don't put them in kilts, I think people who aren't good at accents, and that's probably still a lot of people. We're just going to assume it's Irish. <laughs> For some of that convinced there aren't a lot of people who as, don't as, think as it's I've Irish. As I've noted before, I think it has gotten better. <laughs> it's gen generally gone, but getting better. Outlander was miles and miles ahead of Braveheart. Really except the for those riding down, right? the boots, <laughs> yep. the riding boots with the kilts. Yep. It's like, really? Because the sandals well, just didn't look manly was, enough. Because he was in France for the war, and then that's why they, they rode it into the story. They rode it in. Yeah, essentially. But everybody else was wearing them. Or, or they... They 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 uh, made up an excuse why it it, yeah. it makes sense. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. I know. It's Once stupid. you introduce time travel, anything's possible. That's a fair point. True. True. Yeah. It's an alternate dimension. It's an yeah. alternate reality. So, yeah. it, it really, anything goes. She brought something back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> brought something back. All right. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> but. The, but yeah. What, if, what about other movies? <laughs> I can't say so, if I want to go serious or go silly now. <laughs> yes. A little of both. Um, other Scottish movies, and again, I think they've gotten better. Like uh, the 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 follow up to Braveheart was uh, uh, McFadden's uh, Bruce. Not there, there's two Robert the Bruce oh, movies that recently. came out. Yeah, 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 yeah okay, that okay. came out kind of recently. Mm -hmm. The Robert the the Pine, what, not Robert Pine, Outlaw but, King, Outlaw King. Yeah, yeah, uh, and then uh, Angus McFadden. Mm -hmm. um i think it's how you say his name um he did the follow-up which is the much much he was the guy who played robert the bruce in braveheart right um and then did another movie um in 2018 i think 2017 mm -hmm. something yeah, like that somewhere around there um and you know it was the follow-up to the unofficial follow-up to braveheart mm -hmm. much 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 lower budget yeah. but yeah. you know it's still he was he was trying to be a little bit more realistic and and true to history than mm -hmm. than the original braveheart actually was um braveheart yes. 2 the quest for more money <laughs> indeed <laughs> kilt sales where the real money of the movies made yeah, yeah. but but then i mean outlander is the again is the elephant in the room as far as that is concerned it is, and and then uh but i always go to rob roy you know, which was kind of like many the, Rob Roy's. Well, the the one from the '90s with Liam Neeson, which was basically the bandwagon movie to Braveheart, is like yes, uh, the other some other studio, I can't remember who made it. They said, "Oh, Braveheart, man, I got Scottish movies around. We got to make a Scottish movie." I think they came so, out essentially the same time, which means they would have to have been shot essentially the same time. Yeah, studios, oh, the, like spy on they're each coming other yeah. all the time, yeah, yeah. so it, that's not unexpected. But. Yeah, my my guess, and it's a guess, would be like, oh, this studio is doing a movie about you know Mel, or about uh, Braveheart. <laughs> we should do one about Rob Roy, something else Scottish yep. to compete yeah. with it. Yeah, much much better movie. It's still guilty of all the, the things we're talking about, like time compression and height. You know, not letting the truth get in the way of a good story, but but much better movie in my opinion, and costuming wise, yeah. A lot better, but I would disagree with you a little bit on the one doing it because the other one was doing it. I think there's a lot of examples of like two very similar movies moving forward at the same time. I think usually it's by the time they realize it's happening, they're like, oh, crap, we shouldn't have done this. If they're doing one, we should be doing our own thing. But we're too deep into it now. Like when you have like, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Volcano and uh, the Pierce Brosnan Volcano movie that also came out. This Dante's Peak came out at the same okay. time. Like they just, it, there tends to be something in the in the water, 
or some kind of like volcano story that happened four years before and that got somebody writing which triggered a process and then they both wound up making volcano movies the same year right how jurassic park mm -hmm. came out and then they somebody made that movie about butterflies yeah or Star what? Wars and then Battlestar Galactica. I'm not saying it happens with every movie. Just you, know. uh, you are far less cynical than I am. Yeah. So t to your credit. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you need more conspiracy theories. No, in like you end. don't no. want, like if you see the other studio making a volcano movie, like you don't want to make a volcano movie to compete with that. Like you want to make, you want to make something different, I think. We are way off topic. Yeah. Yeah, fair. <laughs> fair. You know what's funny? I watched the, um, I, Matt and I were doing a TikTok. So I watched some clips from and looked at the, the the promotional images from the Disney Rob Roy movie from the 1950s. Hmm. And son of a gun, if the if the costume wasn't actually half bad, I mean, they're guilty of popularizing the Highland shirt, I think, or what became the Highland shirt, because yeah. he's got he has a laced up 18th century shirt, which is actually more accurate than a Highland shirt. But you can tell that's kind of where things were starting to, oh, that's how you dress if you're a Highlander. Yeah, that got the snowball going down mm -hmm. the hill. Yep. As only Disney can. But the but a lot of the costume is like not bad. And guess what? The colors were right because they had the bright colors. Right. You know, the reds were reds. Okay. It, was, it was not all drab, 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 drab because it's in the past. It was actually more brigadoonish. ish you know? That goes back to Ian's point of meaning expectations. If mm -hmm. you if you create something even if it is historically accurate and you don't meet the audience's expectations, you're essentially pulling them out of the moment, out of the movie, because they're going to look at something and be like, that doesn't feel right. That doesn't look right. Mm -hmm. And you're going to take them out of the experience. Um, so unfortunately, they do have to play a little bit into preconceptions of how things looked or whatever to feel more accurate, even if they're going the opposite direction from accuracy. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, it, it's like the doublets were generally okay. The colors were generally okay. Really wasn't bad nice. um, for the 1950s. I, I think that it's also brighter colors because Technicolor was still sort of kind of new. Yeah. So I was like, I was oh, we're going to make a color too. movie. It's got to be bright colors. Yeah. So, yeah, you're a victim to the technology and what people expect yeah. also because of technology and what you want, what's going to look cool, which is why I am funding right now a Braveheart 3 <laughs> in 3D Oh, excellent. Movie. Yep. Can't wait till we get to number four and we go to space. Yes. Right. Yes. <laughs> green Brave screen. Heart, Braveheart. The whole thing space. green screen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> or we can do an Amityville Braveheart movie. <laughs> so you cannot trust the media when you're putting it together your wardrobe. Is that part of what we're saying here? Yeah. Is that the lesson? Yes. Moving right along. Finally. Footloose and Fancy Free. Oh, that's a zero. That means I have to roll the four side. Dun, dun, dun. Number 13. Really it has to, to be bias against those last four. It has to be tartan in order to be a kilt. Again, that was number 13. If it's not tartan, it's not a kilt. Okay. I'll give this one a little bit more credence than the great kilt one. Really? A little bit more. Really? Do tell. Come a little on. bit more. But no, it Start does not digging. have to be tartan. No. No. Okay. I could see why people I could see why people would make that distinction though. It's a fair distinction. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily one I agree with, but okay. Tartan is so synonymous with kilts. It is, but I'm not opposed to a tweed kilt. Tweed kilts are very historical as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So that's what Eric and I are leering at you for from yeah. our historical yeah. minds. And, and I have no objections to a utility kilt. And solid color kilts too. Yeah. yeah. Are yeah. actually equally. I'm well, counting... not as popular, but they but they co-developed. Yes. We're talking about if we're talking about Victorian age. Um, they could have developed. Yep, and I'm thinking not nearly as popular, but I'm calling tweed solid esque or close okay. enough to solid as well. Okay, um, I'm thinking of the uh, uh, the painting of uh, Robert Brown in his kilt in a mm -hmm. tweed kilt. Mm -hmm. uh, was it ba it's Balmoral or uh, what is? You mean state? John Brown? John Brown. Thank mm -hmm. you. Wrong name. I'm yeah, it's, I think names. I think the setting for the painting is is they have Balmoral in the background where he posed and when they painted it. Yeah, now many, is irrelevant. But they, many years before he invaded Harper's Ferry. But oh god. Touche. <laughs> um, my favorite example of a solid color kilt that's actually from about the same time period is Hodden Gray, which is actually was the, um, uh, the London the, Scottish, the London Rifles, which was a regiment made up of Scots who had emigrated down into the London area from Scotland. And uh, the guy who I can't remember his name, but the guy who founded the unit 
wanted to make sure that there was going to be no inter-clan rivalries or bad mm -hmm. feelings or anything. So instead of going with a tartan, he chose hodden gray, which was a common cloth of uh, common people at the time. It was, it was something that just people all over Scotland were making just when you, you had you know, some wool and you've got a little bit of dye into it, but not enough and just like make the cloth just for work clothes. So you went with that. And then later it started to take on that kind of purplish pinkish color that we see now. But originally it was much more gray gray. Yeah, it's like a, a brownish reddish yeah. gray. Yeah. Do you know, have you have you ever seen the hot and gray color? Or I'm no? sure that I have. Okay. It's kind of neat. <clears throat> they, uh, they have kilts. Um, they would make kilts from it. And it's, it's as I said, it's like a, it's a brownish, you know, brownish reddish gray um yeah, and then they would actually use i think navy blue or blue for the fringe on yes the front of the i think kilt. that's what they do now i'm not sure that yeah. they always did for to take but, all those orders yeah. yes no because <laughs> you can't get the cloth <laughs> oh okay Fair so, enough. don't worry about it is that restricted to the unit i, I don't know we've been asked a, a few times over the years mm -hmm. um but there's no like none of the mills that we use weave it and have it and like oh yep yeah. here we go order a couple yards there you go done so Hmm. No. <laughs> now you could do a grayish kilt, and some of the tweeds that we carry actually have color palettes very similar to hot and gray. Right. But uh, but yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if hot and gray itself is like quasi sort of kind of not really restricted, but like well, we just don't do it. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be sporting. Proper. It wouldn't be proper. But <laughs> but yeah, so there there have always been solid kilts. Just as the tartan was yeah. more popular. So yeah, but I would also say that. Um, uh, utility kilts fall into that same category Those just because uh, the just because it's not tartan just because it's not wool doesn't mean it's not a kilt um so we are we are a, a large enough tent that we even though we don't make utility kilts that i can i personally can say that yeah utility kilts are fine they're not it's a different horse for a different course it's not heritage based it's not family based it's not you know a symbol of a particular thing it's a fashion outgrowth a wart on the <laughs> on the ass of tartan wow no you had wow. a really good thing going yeah, there and then you just <laughs> wow. ruined it at the end i ruined everything you uh, know strike that from the record please <clears throat> it's also no. also great workwear in in similar spirit to the, right. that what you described earlier mm -hmm. yeah it's something different. You're not, it's not trying to be tartan. It's doing something different for its own sake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the, this is where you, it, I think the macro uh, or the, 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 the subtext, if you will, of this is that a non-tartan kilt is not traditional. Therefore, it's not a real kilt. They're, mm -hmm. they're taking the kilt as symbolic national dress. Yes. Not fashion, as you just said, because yes, Anything that's a kilt is technically, it's a man skirt. End of story. But the kilt, a kilt is a proper kilt and it's Scottish national dress. So, you it know, it has to be tartan. So if you're taking that hard a line, then I don't give it as much credence. If you're using it to single out and do that gatekeepy thing, if it's not tartan, I'll get out of here with that nonsense. I think that's totally but where this comes from. I understand the dis I understand the distinction of tartan kilts versus other types of kilts and maybe only liking one. But if you're using it to put down somebody else, forget about it. I don't, don't want to hear it. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's I think that's totally yeah. where it's coming from. Yeah. Is as a gatekeepy thing. Okay. Um, and because it's it's again, I want to feel special. Okay. I'm proud of my heritage, and I don't want anybody watering it down, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. You know, and let's be honest, I mean, a lot of people are making a claim like that. Some of them are very, very, very highly educated traditionalists, but I think the majority of them are people who I would be willing to bet aren't even aware of things like solid color Irish kilts or hot and gray kilts or tweed kilts. They, they don't even know they exist, you know, so... Yeah, that's my supposition yeah it's, it's back to the you know i want to i want to feel special i want to draw a circle and i want to put myself inside the circle and keep other people out of the circle yeah so this is my way of saying no 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 no. i know the right thing i know how it's done this is the right way um yeah it's, it comes from that you know looking down your nose kind of mentality either through full understanding of your looking down the nose or or not understanding, you know, to your point of not understanding that there's traditional, you know, solid car Irish kilts and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's whether you let nostalgia or actual research lead your thinking. Yeah. So and nostalgia can be very, very, very dangerous. Yeah. So. Agreed. Indeed. All right. Cool. 
not to end on a downer sour note how many solid color kills do you guys own at this point zero i have um i'm slowly shrinking back into some uh, <laughs> i think i have good for you two utility kilts um in the back of my closet somewhere and i have one tweed kilt but it's not solid i did a solid tweed and didn't like it mm -hmm. um it looked to women's business suit-esque mm -hmm. um so i ended up uh giving that one away but i have a tweed kilt with a bit of a uh, with a bit of a pattern window check window pane check on it um just for for something a little different it's not one that i wear regularly but i have it just to have it mm -hmm. Cool. I did just recently receive material for my first tweed kilt, though nowhere near solid. It is a turning yeah, tweed. Yeah. No, well then, <laughs> then you're still within the gates. It's okay. Yes. You can still be snobbish. <laughs> I give you permission. Yes. How many solid kilts do you have? Traditional kilts, I have three. Okay. Uh, okay. Utility kilts, I still I have like actually three. Oh, okay. one, of them, one of them has all my band patches on it. So that's a different. Oh, that that's not traditional. I know, that I is know. not a traditional I'll, utility kilt. You can't dig. How do you, you can call so it a utility kilt? A kilt? Yes, yes. I have marred its utilitarian <laughs> function by making it decorative. With, that is with, that 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 is a uh, a mark against uh, my cultural heritage that you would put a patch on a utility <laughs> kilt. <laughs> Iron Maiden isn't a Scottish band. How dare you? Yeah. Yeah. Said with an English accent. <laughs> The English accent is the only snob accent. <laughs> we, like we say, you know, and, 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 and this is this is one of those things. Probably I do. freaking hate this about Holly, but you know, Scots are always dwarves. Hobbits and 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 are are, are Irish apparently, and 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 the Imperial Army in Star Wars and the bad guys are always British because I mean because of the Brits because in the history. American Revolution. <laughs> you can you, also I, because history. But, okay, but you know it's such a freaking cliche. It's you can like, also have Germans are always bad guys. Yep, that's mm -hmm. and I could that's and I would also say you could do a snobby German or a snobby Frenchman. Yeah. Oh um, yes. 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 So that, it's, very, that very Prussian Prussian thing going, yes, or the Parisian, you, yes, the Parisian thing, yeah, yeah. That's a question we should answer at some point later. Is like kilts in other parts of Europe, yeah, Celtic, the Celtic influence and the Celtic roots of other parts of Europe, because yeah. they had them. That's where it started. Indeed, <sighs> yeah. Kilts or the Celts? Right at the end. The Celts, yeah, not the kilts. The Celts. Yeah, the Celts. Yes. Celtic Indeed. culture started. Not those vows. But that is another topic for another for story. another show. For another, for another haggis hunting hunt. of oh. the haggises. Indeed. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on this rather weird, bumpy ride. <laughs> which, as they tend to be. Which, which, as they tend to be, which honestly is the best part and why we want to keep doing them. Um, we will see you again, or listen to you again, or you'll listen to us. Something like that. Next time. Slanjava. 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 Thanks for watching the video, guys. Remember, if you like what you see, Give our video a thumbs up. It helps us defeat the YouTube algorithm and make our stuff rocket up to the top of the suggested videos list. Also, if you dig the content we produce, please subscribe to the channel.